Hi, my name is Travis and you're watching Curious Tangents and this is the largest black hole in the known universe. It's about 66 billion times the size of our own sun, which means that we could fit several solar systems inside of it. And it's got a lot in common with 1950s football, the terrible design of American cities, video games, and the way that you feel about your everyday life. In the 1940s, John T. Riddle invented the first plastic football helmets. They were nowhere near what we have today, but they were a gigantic step up from the leather helmets that football players were wearing in the 30s, and they were becoming popular. This was a more protective helmet than what came before, so we would expect that as it became more popular, football players would have fewer injuries. Yet the exact opposite happened. Injuries, specifically ones to the head and neck, Increase. As players felt that they were more protected, they also felt more liberated to do dangerous things like spearing or head-first tackling, thus the increase in injuries to the head and neck. On the complete opposite end of the gaming scale, if you ever played a game of chess, then you might know that there are hundreds of different moves with billions of different positions. And you also know that every single time you lose a piece, you are also exponentially losing the options to move. Because this decreases the amount of pressure that you can put on your opponent while also decreasing the amount of freedom that you have to move, every single piece that you lose makes you more likely to continue losing. Let's compare that to Mario Kart, inarguably the greatest multiplayer game ever devised. It is also engineered to be the polar opposite of chess. Let's say you fought your way to the front of the line in Mario Kart, passing your opponent being the equivalent of taking their chess pieces. Suddenly, the game gets progressively harder. Mystery boxes, a mechanism that Mario Kart uses to introduce more chance or luck into the system, is probably a thing that helped you get to first place. When you're in 10th or 8th, you can get things like bullet bills and stars. But when you're in first place, it's not nearly as helpful. You'll be getting coins. The further in the lead you are, the more difficult it is to get further in the lead. Maybe more importantly, the further behind you are, now the easier it is to catch up. Maybe you see the same thing happen in a lot of different party games, but basically they're trying to create a scenario where anybody can win. Mario Kart, like most party games, was engineered to maximize fun. It's designed so that anybody could win, and it does this by distributing luck. In John Green's last book, The Anthropocene Reviewed, he writes about how his eight-year-old son was able to beat him in Mario Kart despite him having 26 years of experience. This same thing would never happen in a game of chess. Newbies never lose to grandmasters. What the chapter is actually about are unjust feedback loops in socioeconomic systems, but this video is just about feedback loops, and I think nothing does a better job of illustrating them than Mario Kart and chess. In fact, I would argue that feedback loops are at the heart of almost every single system. In chess, we have a positive feedback loop. That doesn't mean it's good, it simply means that one behavior enforces that same behavior. As one person begins to win by taking their opponent's pieces, every piece that they take then makes them more likely to take another, thus making them more likely to win. In Mario Kart, every few positions that you move up the lead decreases the quality of the items that you can get. This means that in Mario Kart, losers are less likely to continue losing, whereas in chess, losers are more likely to continue losing. Unfortunately, our biological systems seem to be more like chess than they are like Mario Karts. And when playing a game, whether it's football, chess, or Mario Kart, the biochemistry of the winner is different than that of the loser. In what's known as the winner effect, those who won or were on the winning team experience a sharp increase in testosterone. Testosterone is probably a more complex hormone than what you think of. While it's a steroid hormone that causes a lot of the changes in the body that we associate with masculinity, it's also a reinforcing hormone. Winning releases testosterone, and testosterone reinforces the behaviors that made it first release. It's also worth noting that testosterone spikes also make people feel better, part of the reason why winning feels so good and losing feels so bad. In addition, losers get a boost of cortisol, a stress hormone that in many ways creates the opposite effect of testosterone, working to create avoidant behaviors instead of reinforcing them. This can be found in pretty much any competitive setting, but it can also be found if you're just associated with the winning team. People who were at home watching their football team win had the same effect. 
though not as strongly. Even being an investor during an economic boom has the same effect, as well as being an investor during an economic downturn. In the beginning of this video, I mentioned the poor design of American cities. They are generally considered to be the least livable in the developed world. In the post-war 1940s, cars were becoming incredibly popular in the Americas. This meant many, many different things, among them that car companies were becoming more powerful and that people had a general increase in mobility. Because they were becoming more powerful, they started doing things like lobbying to have places built that could only be accessed via car. This led to situations where developers were heavily incentivized or oftentimes legally required to build places that were car dependent. This led to people living in places that would have been previously remote and currently financially unsustainable. Being more spread out and generally inefficient uses of land, this led to places that were financially unsustainable sustainable. It also decreased walkability and decreased the amount of people who were living among anyone who was socio or economically different from themselves. Because there are now literally millions of buildings where the only real way to safely leave them is to drive off in a car, mobility has actually decreased significantly. And maybe worst of all, many thinkers believe that it's contributed to rampant individualism, sometimes referred to as the atomization of society. Because in most neighborhoods, housing is generally designed to be the same price, in fact, part of the way that we price housing is by the houses surrounding it, people in one neighborhood generally have the same economic status. This means that people who are financially well off can only really interact with other people who are financially well off, whereas people who aren't so well off can only interact with other people who aren't so well off. The implication being that no one knows about the other person's issues. This thus goes to influence the way that people are voting and, well, the way that they engage with every other part of their life. You're less likely to know and, more importantly, care about the problems affecting their economic group because you don't interact with them. Thus, when it comes time to vote or engage civically, you do so without them in mind. People have a tendency to only really pay attention to problems that are in their proximity. And we've done a lot to make sure that people who aren't like us are out of our proximity. These places are referred to as American suburbia. And the more popular that they became, the more car dependent that Americans became. Thus, the more powerful car companies got, and the more prevalent cars became, thus making suburbs more populated. It's a positive feedback loop, just like a game of chess, though a bit more complex in that it involves more actors. Today, this has progressed so much that it's commonly written outside of the United States that a car is to an American what a fish is to water. It's not just a vessel for movement, it's the only option. I've got at least 10 city planning videos planned. So how do feedback loops affect you? You could say that the more a person loses, the more they tend to lose. And maybe that's true in a way. In society, as we see a person as a loser, we tend to treat them worse. In the book Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't, Jeffrey Pfeffer writes about how when one person has their status lowered by losing in some sort or being victimized, we tend to assign blame to them regardless of if there is actually blame to assign. In an experiment where participants were chosen by an experimenter to be randomly shocked, those who were chosen were more likely to be socially rejected later on in a meeting. This is despite the fact that everyone was in on the experiment. Everyone participating knew that the selection was random, yet those selected were still treated worse. I've said this before, but the brain is not a truth-seeking machine, it's a survival machine. Maybe the reason why this happens is because when it looks at something unfortunate happen to someone, it forms a map and tries to find a way not to repeat the same steps that that person took. And like all maps, sometimes it's useful, but it's always a distortion. Maybe that's also why the just world hypothesis exists, or the fact that people who are more well off tend to think that the world is a more fair place. So let's say you're stuck in a downward feedback loop, what can you actually do about it? Well, you could take a tip from the military. A famous routine upheld in the military is making your bed properly first thing in the morning. This seems simple, small, and insignificant, but it's for a good reason and it's not just appearance. Admiral William McRaven explains that part of the reason why they have soldiers do this 
is to manufacture a win. While this seems like a very small thing, your self-image is a lot more dependent on the frequency of winning than it is on the size of your actual win. So it turns out that if you're doing something long term, finding little ways to trick yourself into thinking that you can win is the best way to win. Admiral McRaven goes on to say that it's because you can make your bed anytime that you wake up and it doesn't take a tremendous amount of time. However, this strategy can be applied to pretty much anything. If you're trying to build a social life, like I was a little while ago, do things that make you seem more interesting than you actually are. Like going to science centers when you have a science YouTube channel. If it's an exercise routine, don't set the goalpost at Olympic level routine for a whole hour. Set it at just to get started and then move it back from there. When I'm making my next video, I'm not going to think about the fact that I failed to make one for two whole months. I'm going to be thinking about the fact that I just recently made this one. And after I make that one, I'll think about the fact that I just recently made that one. Oh, and black holes. Black holes emit a form of electromagnetic radiation called Hawking radiation. The smaller that a black hole is, the more Hawking radiation it emits. However, the more Hawking radiation it emits, the smaller the black hole gets. Meaning that the closer to death a black hole is, the more Hawking radiation it is constantly emitting. That means that black holes die the same way that people win games of chess, with positive feedback loops. And if you like this video, you'll probably like this one that I did about willpower and all of the ways that willpower constantly fails and some of the ways that it works. Thanks for watching.